I'm Matt Pinfield, this is KLOS and new and approved and really happy to introduce you to our guest tonight who is Tommy Shaw from the band Styx who have a brand new album which is coming out called Crash of the Crown and uh, the new single is out now called Reveries, really really great track and uh, it's a real classic feel of Styx for a guy who's been a fan of theirs since I was very young in junior high uh, it's really nice to hear the way the new record sounds and Tommy, it's good to see you again, man. How you doing? Hey, Matt. It's good to see you. You know, it's great. I mean, last time we were together was New York City. You, me, and JY, we were uh, in this place called The Cutting Room, and it's, it's amazing. It feels like so long ago now, but uh, of course, you guys have been killing it, and I wanted to talk to you because this record sounds great. I mean, just the feel of the record, so, and this is like, really, for the band, it's record number 18, so... It's amazing when you think about it, how many records that you guys have done and the tours. I want to ask you about conceiving Crash of the Crown. Can you tell me about this record and when you started working on it? Well, it was a slow easing into it. You know, after we finished the mission um, four years ago, I guess we released it four years ago, uh, we, we just... We never stopped writing, you know. You, you, when you're a writer, well, it, it's personally for me. There's always something going on in in my little inner radio. Sometimes it's uh, a, a a song I don't want to hear that somebody else did, or it's um, you know a, a little piece of music that uh, that I, that will catch my attention, and I'll make a little video of it, um, and then I'll, I'll find a guitar and. And just you know, kind of gather little pieces, and some of them feel like that this could be made into a song. This this started telling a story, and that's the best thing is to have something that okay, here's the first page of the book. What's on the on the next page? And so those we had a lot of those happen, and uh, then it came time. You know, we we felt like we had enough, and we had done a lot of writing demos. Willie Vankovich and I had. And he makes these great writing demos where he, he pretends he's Todd Zuckerman on, uh, on uh, Easy Drummer. And uh, so, he, so we have a, a drum track that sounds like Todd a little bit. And, uh, and then he and I play all the other instruments and guitars and, and, and vocals and that sort of thing. And we flesh them out and pretend they're, you know, uh, that this is a new song, which it is. So we, we started compiling those. And, um, you know, little by next thing you know, you've got nine, ten of these things, and you just keep going because you want to you beat the ones that you have. Yeah. So um, we just, we did that, and then the pandemic shut everything down. But by that time, we had, uh, we had been in the studio. Some of the guys had come here. Uh, um, Ricky, Ricky came. Lawrence had been here quite a bit because he, he co-wrote with Will and me. And so, right in this room, we we finished almost the whole album. It wasn't until the end of almost three quarters of the way through the pandemic, there were two more songs that got written. They were actually during that period, uh, and that was "Our Wonderful Lives" and a song called "To Those." But you put them all together, and it's really kind of a, just the consciousness of of all of us in that time when we were writing songs. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really mean for it to be a concept album, but we were just telling stories, M you know, making up stories, telling things that are based on life experiences and that sort of thing. You've always been that way, Tommy. I mean, as a songwriter, uh, you've been doing that from the very beginning. I mean, you've been, you know, taking the point of view as a storyteller, um, whether it's in like, you know, the third person or a second person or an observer. You, you've been really good at that. I think that's one of the gifts that you have as a songwriter, uh, definitely. You know, and I, and I wanna go back um, because it's just with the incredible rich history of Styx, I mean, I love the story about when you first ended up joining the band um, at that period of time before Crystal Ball, like when they were gonna be going out on the road for Equinox. Can you th when you, can you tell me that story because I know that you were going to audition but you never even got your guitar out right? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, you remembered that. <laughs> yeah, but it was 
Well, I can tell you, uh, the last thing you ever want to do is to cancel or reschedule a tour. Uh, something that's, uh, that people have gone to great, you know, lengths to organize and route and, you know, put the crew and everything together and uh, to, to have to scrap that and start all over again, you just, you never really catch back up on that momentum. And they had, they had a new album, Equinox, on a new label, A&M. They had a new manager, Derek Sutton, who was used to doing national acts and working with major labels. And uh, they had this, you know, Equinox was this great record. They were getting airplay on uh, Lorelei, I believe it was. And then all of a sudden, you know, John Serluski just said, I, I'm out. Uh, so they, you know, put out, out feelers, you know, with this, we need somebody who can sing the high parts, who looks like you would be in the band, and um, plays guitar, and that was kind of it. Uh, and it turned out they, they, the thing was you had to sing that high note in Lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I, you I could, which that. was great, right? I mean, that was the thing, and that's a high note to hit. Well, that, that, that completes the triad of, uh, th you know, three vocals. Yeah. Three-part harmonies, and so I, I just did that, and I think the, it was okay, we can work the rest of it out. So I never had to pick up a guitar. I played some demos of uh, songs I'd written, um, and that, but that was it. It was like, uh, go home, here's some albums, uh, learn these 13 songs, and get your stuff and come back because we're hitting the road. It's amazing. Now, coming from Montgomery, Alabama, and then, you know, joining bands, chasing your dreams, working the way you did, even through, you know, playing with bands in Chicago, and before that, that band, The Smoke Ring, you were like, guys, were all over the place, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you were, you so so for you, Tommy, you were a kid, you just, like, you knew you wanted to play in rock and roll and be in music. That was the thing you, you were determined, right? I mean, that was, you had made that decision. Yeah, I was, you know, it, it captured me on a, on a night when, before I turned 10 years old, uh, my, one of my older brother's friend had left a tenor, a tenor four string acoustic guitar at the house. And up to that point, I was, because I was nine years old, no one in the neighborhood would let me touch their instruments, you know, because I was a kid. Uh, so I waited for everybody to go to sleep and I snuck in there and I took that guitar and went out on the, the little cement, you know, slab, you know, Thing outside the front door and I sat there and I just kind of sounded out the notes to Ghost Riders in the Sky and it was like this is not that hard <laughs> uh, and, and from that point I just you know bugged my parents to get me a guitar and you know learn some Beatles songs and won a 4-H talent contest singing uh, um, I want to hold your hand uh, and uh, you know, it just went on from there. I, when I was 12, I started working professionally, and um, I had a good ear, so I could I couldn't read music, but I, I, I could play standard songs because those you know most of the standard kind of songs they they tell you where they're going next, so I could play the chords and just kind of fake my way through it, and it just you know just little steps and steps and steps and. Played along, played in lots of bands uh, in Montgomery. I played in a soul band that taught me more than probably anybody. I was a little white guy in a, in a killer soul band called Bobby Moore and the Rhythm Aces, just for a few shows. But I learned uh, it was a whole education on dynamics and feel and and bluesiness. And um, so by the time I, you know, played in all the clubs and graduated high school. I was ready to get out of town and it just so happened a guy uh, named Bobby Smith, uh, they called him Smitty, was a, um, a booking agent from Nashville. He somehow heard about me, got my number, called me and invited me up to Nashville because he was putting the band together. And, um, you know, I, I got up there and when I went for the meeting, he was like, uh, I said, where's the band? He said, well, no, we're building the band around you. And I was not ready for that. I, I was... I want, I, I want to be in a band where I'm like the least guy and I want to learn from everybody else. So uh, I, I was, it was just, I was devastated <laughs> up there. I was like, this is, this was, ah, you know, it didn't happen. But my buddy that went up there with me from, uh, from Montgomery, 
well, he and I went to see this band at in Cir um, uh, Electric Circus in Printer's Alley, and they were this killer rock band with horns. And uh, I thought, God, I'd love to be in that band. And he's this gregarious guy, and he went and talked to them during the break, and talked them into. I think they called me up and let me sit in with them, and uh, talked them into hiring me. I talked them into hiring him as a crew guy, and then we took off, and we were out on the road until 1975. Right, when you ended up uh, joining uh, with the guys in Sticks. And you know, it's amazing because really, I mean, Crystal Ball was the first full album that you were on after touring for Equinox and learning all those tracks. But then when Grand Illusion came, I mean, that's when things were blown wide open, you know, and it's amazing. You know, I, I, uh, I was one of those kids in America who was a suburban kid who I was a fan of the bands, was following the band, and brought, brought that record to parties, The Grand Illusion, you know, play for people. And I'll tell you a funny story. I re I'll never forget it. It seems like a scene out of Dazed and Confused or something, but I remember bringing it to a party and saying, you got to listen to this Sticks record. And these guys were drinking underage, and I hear a guy screaming, and I think it's because he's really excited about the record, but he was drinking a flaming shot of 151 rum and he forgot to blow it out before he put it in his mouth so he set his mouth on fire i was like whoa that is some 70s insanity right there yeah. <laughs> it was the craziest story but um you know what i mean what a great record and of course fooling yourself the songs that you brought to the record it all of a sudden things really really happened it was just uh, an incredible time for the band how was that for you when you saw tommy you know all the work you had done touring in bands that, the dream for, for rock and roll and just, and, and you know, and then things really taking off from there. Can you can talk to me a little bit about that period for you when you saw things really start to go and, and, and the world and America really understand that here's a band a force to be reckoned with at that time? Well, Styx was, was, a, was already a great band. Uh, I had never seen them before. But uh, one of the guys in our band went to see them one night, and we were, we were thinking, they can't be any good, you know. Uh, they're putting a new album out every year. With, they think they couldn't be any good. We don't, they don't ever come to clubs. And, well, he, he and one of the other guys went to see them, and he came back, and he said, they're, they're not good. They're great. They're awesome. <laughs> because we wanted to hate them. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, they were, they were making records, even though it was a small label they they had figured it out and they had studio experience and and now uh you know they're they've hired me and it was so much fun just getting out there i mean i it was just like i it was like somebody had, i'd been trapped and now i've just been let, set free in this amazing situation where it's a killer band everybody can sing everybody plays great they write they've got a, an audience that's growing and uh, you know, I was a very excited new guy. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And, and you know, throughout those years and throughout all those albums, you brought so many great, moving, you know, powerful songs and a lot of energy to the, to the, the equation, everything that you'd done at the time. It's amazing you were talking about the guys being on a small label because they were on that wooden nickel label, like that uh, like indie label, I think it was yeah, called, know. right? RCA, RCA Subsidiary. Yeah, RCA Subsidiary, where Lady was original. Because you guys... When Todd joined the band, you re-recorded Lady, I remember. I remember he said that to me. Your drummer. I think that was the right. first thing he actually ended up uh, playing on was the re-record of Lady. Uh, well, and the reason he did that was because John Panazzo was ill. Yeah. And he was unable to make the session. So uh, our uh, Keith Marks, who was our uh, production manager at the time, uh, he, he said, I know this guy because he, he did Cartage for our studio. So he had moved Todd's drums around bit and heard him in the studio. So we have him to thank uh, for bringing Todd Zuckerman into the fold. And we heard him and, well, you've heard him too. So, yeah, he's great. Uh, he's only gotten better if there is such a thing. Yeah. Uh, His drum room is unbelievable, man. You know, like uh, he and I were on a, we were guests on on, on Carmine and Vinny Apache or a piece, depending on who you speak to with their last name. We were both guests on there together, you know, like a few weeks back. And I was... Saying to Tyler, like his drum room was amazing. It's just everything that he had. It's incredible. And you know that it, it came in so handy because uh, Todd he has a he has a young daughter and he he didn't leave the house. He was not taking any risks at all during the lockdown. 
Uh, so we, we wound up, th this, this technology arose up out of a need, and we were able to record all of his drums. He was in his studio in uh, uh, Austin. His engineer was at his own house uh, in Austin. He was controlling Todd's Pro Tools rig. And Will and I were in this room right here. We're standing like right here and looking at and talking to them on a Zoom call. And so he would do a take uh, and play with the track. And we'd listen back through these monitor speakers. And, uh, and we had notes, we would take notes and, and say, okay, try this. And, and he would go, let me, let me do it this way. And it was, in many ways, it was identical to being in a, in a regular studio where we're all there because when you do that, the way we record, you know, we don't all go out in the same, in the room at the same time. We, we do rhythm tracks and, or we'll do, you know, work something with, with the demo and uh, then Todd will go do his master drum track. But, but even in the big studio, we'll all be in the control room looking at the monitor on, in between the, the big studio, uh, the video monitor between the big studio monitors. And he will walk out of that room, go about 80 feet away to the drum room, play, and we'll watch him and listen to him over the speaker. So it was the same thing. He was just, you know, in Austin instead of 80 feet away. Yeah, which is amazing. Oh, and we had, the, we had the benefit of all his snare drums in his studio. So it was, in some ways, uh, it, was, it really worked out to our advantage to have him be there. I mean, it, the drums on this record, I, I think, are my favorite drums on any Styx record. Yeah, they're very powerful. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of different elements of sound there as well, you know, which is really cool. I mean, just the different levels. So it's we interesting. Keep, we were able to keep that small drum sound, which has been kind of the sound of Styx from day one. And speaking of the sound of Styx, I mean, the thing has always been so amazing were the harmonies. And uh, I love that you told me the story that that was the real reasoning when you could do that vocal when you first joined the band. You know, I wanted to also t ask you about, you know, Too Much Time On My Hands has always been uh, just what a great song. And there was a there was an incident um, in, was it Niles, Michigan at a bar? Is that where it took place where the inspiration for that song came from? Yeah, there was a, a place called Mark's Bar. It's, it was technically called Mark's Tavern. And it was right next door to the Catholic Church because it was there before the church and the church was built so and the uh, monsignor was all you'd see him over there at lunchtime all the time you know knocking a few down <laughs> and every it was it was like a cheers kind of place too where you, you 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 know most of the people in there the drinks were cheap classes were small uh so you know it was just this just this awesome little watering hole and uh so when it came time to do the video that was the thing that i had in in my mind, and Jim Cahill, who directed it with me, he had the same vision. Uh, it was like, let's do Mark's Tavern. So we found a, a old bar uh, in Santa Monica in Los Angeles and shot it there. Yeah. Was it like uh, Shea J or one of those? It was, uh, I can't remember which one, maybe. No, it was, a, it was a gay bar called the Manhole. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I see, yeah. <laughs> but, and got to rent it for the day, right? But but the song itself, though, Tommy, so the song itself, was it inspired by you hanging out there at that bar at some point in time? Well, it was, yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah, because drinks were cheap, so you could buy a round for everybody and and not go broke. So everybody was like, woo, so-and-so's buying a round, I, you know. And yeah. uh, so if you, were, if you were buying rounds, of course you're going to be the most popular guy in the room. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Now, um, you know, let's talk, can we talk about Renegade 2 and go back to Pieces of Eight for a minute? Because that's such a great tune. What was the thing that inspired that song? It was me um, uh, listening to an Alan Parsons record, The Tales of Edgar Allan Poe. And, um, I think that was the name of it. And there was this song on there. Um, and I'm, not, I'm a guitar player. I, I can write songs on piano, but it has to be very slowly. And because I've, I've, I'm not a trained pianist, let me, let me walk away. I'll show you what I was doing, and you'll hear how terrible I am. I'm going to go over here for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's great. I was trying to figure out this song. Uh, Anyway, 
see, there's my piano uh, prowess right there. But I, uh, it, I started taking those inversions of the chords, and I just shifted them around instead of go da 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 da. Instead, I went dum 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 da da, and used those chords that I figured out by listening to the Alan Parsons song, and so I had a um, four-track T-Act tape recorder. Remember those? Yeah, those four tracks. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, real. So I could do enough tracks to make a little demo of it. So I, I, I got enough stuff on there. I got the guitar out uh, and, and did a little demo of the song. And uh, that was how I presented it to the band. And I, and I played it on guitar a little bit. But you could see it would be, it was like, Dun, 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 dun. No, it was uh, dun, 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 dun. it was slow like that because that's as fast as I could play it on the piano. But everybody listened to it and they said, "Yeah, let's 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 rock it up." So the more we kept rocking it up, uh, you know, Dennis and JY were both like, "Let's let's make this a, a rock song," and that's how it became Renegade. And then we. You know, I, I'd written the words, so I had that part of it, uh, the chorus and everything. But, you know, and that gave us an opportunity to do the big vocal stacks that, you know, the three-part harmonies on it. And the song just sort of took off on its own after that. Yeah, it certainly did. It came in right towards the end of the album there. What about the first time you presented Fooling Yourself, you know, um, uh, back you know, when you were bringing tracks in for Grand Illusion, when it came time to start writing uh, for that album. That's, uh, tell me, about, also tell me about writing that song. Well, you know, you, sometimes you think you're writing songs about someone else, and then you start reading it, and it's like, I think I might be writing about myself. <laughs> and you're, but I, I wrote that on the acoustic guitar, and what happens to me a lot is I'll, ha I'll come up with these ideas and chord progressions and a melody line and maybe a word or two in a, in a chorus or something like that. But then I want to make a demo. It's like, well, i got to write some words. So uh, often that will be where my brain's done this homework without my, me realizing it, and it just flows out. And that's, that's what happened there. I just started telling this story. You know, somebody who's really got it made, but they're not enjoying it, you know, and, and somebody needs to tell, tell them, you know, snap out of it. it. And everything's great, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up. Yeah, like live in the moment, actually, right? And kind of and, and enjoy what yeah. you have. Have some gratitude, right? It's, that's part of what that song yes, is about. Yes, yes. There, there is a lot of, as a songwriter uh, and a recording artist, there's a lot of self-loathing that's, built into the process because uh, you don't want to play it for anybody until you're as sure as you can possibly be that, that they're not going to look at it and go yeah okay you know you don't want to you, you don't want to be rejected uh, and so you, you do your best and so you, you you try and make the song as good as you can before you bring it to the band and then if, if they like it then it's, they're naturally going to propel it into, into the you know the body and soul of the band. Yeah, and it and it certainly did work out that way, and has with so many of the records. Let's get uh, before we close up. I want to talk about uh, the new album because uh, the song that we uh, we're playing is is called Reveries. It's a it's really a great song, and it's got a classic feel to it. Um, you know, it just it just feels like the sticks that so many of your fans know and love uh, and it, it feels like a continuation of what you do can you tell me more about that song well it it, as it worked out I mean it was another one of those songs where I, I, I just wrote a couple of verses or a verse and a half in a, in a chorus and Will had an instrumental track he, he had done this this tuning I think I have let me see if I got the guitar no wrong guitar uh, he did a, this odd tuning on one of my guitars. Yeah, you can bring it if you want to. Like a one and a five. Yeah. So he, he did that, instru that intro, and then he worked out uh, a, a verse chords and then a, uh, 
a chorus chords, but he didn't have any uh, uh, melodies or lyrics. So he sent that to me, and, and I wrote the first verse and the chorus. Um, and then we had enough to make a demo of that. And that song, it just it just burst. I mean, it was it was Will's track, lyrics, vocals, boom, and now let's do, do the arrangement of it. Uh, and it really, the the thing that I kept thinking about is how uh, conscious we are of how whether we're liked or not. When you go on, you can't help but if you put something out there to see how many likes you get. And uh, if you if you you're gonna feel good about how many you get, then you gotta feel okay about the ones that you don't get. You know, so it's a it's something we've all bec become accustomed at. But I thought it was a good uh, idea for for a song. I think it's great. Now, Tommy, I've got to ask you because, you know, so many people when you're coming up, like, you know, you were uh, as a young musician, uh, and then when you get out and you get to tour and, and you've, you know, been on the road with different artists over the years, um, I wanted to ask you about your heroes, who you loved, who were your musical heroes when you were younger, and have you gotten to have any experiences with them on the road? Have you met some of those? And is there one in particular that you remember you can talk to us about? Well, I was a fan of Hank Williams, but he, he was no longer around. He did live, I mean, he, he was uh, buried, his gravesite was about, I don't know, 15 minute walk from my house in Montgomery. And a lot of us would, my buddies and I would, every so often on a full moon, take a bottle of cheap wine at Boone's Farm, probably go out to, to Hank's grave, and there's a little bench you can sit on, there's AstroTurf there, and we sit out there and sing it you know, Hank songs and drink Boone's Farm and, you know, it's like, there he is right there. Uh, it was these great tombstones with giant music notes on either side and, and then the lyrics to I Saw the Light on it, sunbeams coming through there. Uh, I, I loved Hank Williams. Uh, but then I, I, I worked in um, lounges playing standards. Uh, and I worked with this this older gentleman, Hi Bromberg, who, who played piano and somehow got this gig in a lounge and was playing all these standards. And so I learned, uh, I couldn't read music, but I had a really good ear. So that really helped me learn how to navigate through chord changes and, and, and really neat inversions and things like that. And uh, worked with other, you know, with a, a kind of a torch song singer. You know, this lady'd sit there smoking a cigarette and singing these these bluesy songs, but they're jazzy. You know, with me and maybe a drummer, maybe a bass player, uh, and I loved all that. Meanwhile, my friends were starting up Led Zeppelin cover bands and things and progish things, uh, but I was working, playing standards and playing in clubs, and meeting more people and meeting more musicians who were playing clubs. So I I got into doing clubs almost all the way through high school. Well, from the time I started, by my senior, by my senior year, I was playing three or four nights a week. Um, senior year, you're playing three or four nights a week. That's amazing. How are you doing that, Tommy, and then doing schoolwork as well? I mean, were you kind of juggling that situation? Well, I was doing one of them really well. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the school. So I graduated. You know, I, I knew I wasn't going to go to college. I was going to get out of school and hit the road. So I was doing the non-college prep courses, so that wasn't, it wasn't that, that hard to get up and be kind of sleepy and get through all that. I graduated in summer school, and then next thing I knew, uh, I was on the road and I went up to Nashville, and, um, you know, and didn't meet people. One thing led to another, and uh, Sticks tour manager came to see the band I was in up in Chicago um, about six months before before, um, before I got hired as a, as a member of the band. Because what happened was the, the band just, there were, disco music was, was taking over all the gigs that our band had. And we were playing uh, original music and eight of us on stage, the club owners didn't like us. And little by little, they just sort of, sort of wore us down and we, we went back home, everybody went home. And I was uh, back in Montgomery uh, at the invitation of an old, uh, uh, bandmate to go play uh, in a bowling alley lounge with him and a couple of other guys from from Montgomery, and, and uh, one that I'd sung with before but never been in a band with. 
at Jim, Jim Bob Jones, and it said there's no dance floor, about a hundred people come and they just want to hear music. And so uh, there was a six month period where I was doing that and it was, it was awesome. A lot of acoustic stuff, I played pedal steel on some songs, and uh, people just came and, and listened. And it, was, it was fantastic. Um, but then, then one day I got the call to uh, go audition for Sticks, and then uh, everything changed. Yeah, that's amazing, though. I mean, just doing all those, those dates uh, in high school. But that really gets you, I mean, it really gets your chops good, too. I mean, you, you, the more you play, right, I mean, the better it gets. Yeah, and the, the Bobby Moore and the Rhythm Aces, they had a song that was a national hit uh, called Searching for My Love, but the chorus was, Searching, searching for my baby. Yes, I am. I'm searching, searching for my baby. I, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's yeah. been in movie soundtracks. Yeah, I've heard it, definitely. I got, I, I played a few, I subbed in that band, I, uh, and I learned so much from them about dynamics and just watching each other and signals and um, vamping and, and bringing it down and bringing it back up. And that's, that's served me the rest of my life. Uh, never really was in a rock band, um, soul band. I was in a soul yeah. cover band. The Sticks was really, uh, well, MS Funk, the band that I left after that, they were like a rock soul band. So, uh, you know, I was working my way up to being in a full rock band. Yeah, and it all worked out really well. Tell me, what's uh, happening after the pandemic? Have uh, you and JY and, and, uh, and Todd and everybody have been talking about uh, hitting the road? Is there, is there a discussion about tour dates in support of the new album? Oh, I'm starting to pack my bags now. We're, we're leaving <laughs> next week. Oh, that's great. So Crash of the Crown, you're going to hit the road for the album. Um, do you know how long you're going to be out for? And who's going to be on the road with you this time around? It's going to be, for the first part, first, uh, I think, 10 or 11 dates, it's going to be us and Collective Soul. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Ed Rowland's a great guy. Those guys are good people. Uh, what a killer band. You know, a great writer and great musician and creator of some killer music. Yeah. And really good people from the Atlanta area there. You know? They're great. Yes. Absolutely. Well, that sounds awesome. Well, Tommy, I want to just say it was really great catching up with you. It was good to see you again. I'm glad to see you. You guys are getting back out on the road. I know your fans are excited because they're ready to go see some live music. They want to see some live rock and roll. They're ready to get out and about. Yeah, you know, we, we kept in, in touch with our crew because we kept our crew going. They not, nobody had to lose their house. Nobody had, had any uh, real hardships. Uh, kind of kept everything status quo. And so, uh, you know, they were, they've been able to get out front as soon as we got their word, okay, we're going to do this, dump the trucks, went through all the gear, you know, because stuff's set for over a year in, uh, you know, it's winter, summer, up in the, in the trucks up in Chicago. So they've gone through all that, and uh, they are ready. We've rebuilt a bunch of stuff, and, um, and we're ready to, to pick up where we left off and then move forward. I just got to say, I, I got to give you complete credit and props and say what a beautiful thing it is that you guys kept your crew going uh, during this because it was, you know, you know, obviously what, how it was for so many people. And yeah, for well, you we, guys to, to tell we were, me. Go ahead. We were fortunately, we, we, we had the, the means to do it and, uh, you know, minded every penny of it, helped them get what money they were, were entitled to from the government uh, checks and helped them with unemployment and just cobbled all these things together with with a fund that we had and uh and and, and made it happen and I'm, I'm really proud of uh my, my bandmates and manager for for going that route yeah and it was great to see our crew you know uh we do zoom calls we start doing those every week and saying happy birthday. I don't know if you've ever tried to have people on a Zoom call. Oh, Zoom. yeah. It's, 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 it's like probably one of the worst vocal arrangements in history is having a bunch of people sing on Zoom. It's comical. It's unbelievable. We do it all the time. It's nuts. I know. It's horrible. And we will do that at the gigs because we, we sell it. Sometimes we'll do that. Everybody just sing their own melody in their own time. And it's, it's fun. Bir uh, birthdays... Well, Birthdays gave me the, uh, an excuse to uh, pick up my guitar and sing, make up a song and send it to, you know, almost all my friends got birthday <laughs> weird songs from me. 
Um, I, I still do. I, I love, who doesn't want to hear a, a happy birthday? Exactly. Yeah. Who wouldn't? I mean, and I think that's great. Tommy, I want to say thank you so much for spending the time today. I'm really excited about uh, you guys being back out on the road with Collective Soul and that you have a new album out now and always great to catch up with you. you know? Same here, Matt. Uh, come see us, buddy. It's, it's been a long time. Oh, I'm definitely going to come out and see you without a question. I got to come say hi to JY and Todd and everybody else, you know, so. Yeah. I'll yeah, you'll, you'll meet Willie Bankovich. He's, I, he's going out with us. I can't wait to meet Willie, man. He's do, doing great work with you. So that's, that's what really What a cool. super, super talent. Yeah. Oh my that's going to be great. Well, listen, Tommy, thanks for taking the time today, man. And congratulations on the new album. It's very exciting. And everybody's pumped that you have a new record out and are hitting the road. So, Tommy, we'll see you on the road. We'll see you uh, when you get to the West Coast. Okay? All right, Rob. Okay. All right. It's great to see you. Bye, everybody. Bye now. Tommy Shaw, everybody, from Styx, don't forget the new album, Crash of the Crown. It's available now. I'm Matt Pinfield. This is KLOS, new and approved. Thanks so much for watching and listening.